Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Beyond Good and Evil by Friedrich Nietzsche. So Nietzsche is one of those authors that people always tell me I should enjoy. It's actually kind of a bit of a cliche because my MBTI, Myers-Briggs personality type, is INTJ. And the meme is that INTJs love Nietzsche. I thought it was okay, but we're going to um, get to more of that in a little bit. What I will say is that most of what I've tabbed out here are just like little aphorisms and stuff and little quotes. Um, I don't necessarily have a huge amount of opinions to share because I don't have a huge amount of opinions on what was written here. It's like, okay, mate, you do you. But anyway, I'm going to read the blurb, go through and check out some of my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads. That which is done out of love always takes place beyond good and evil. Beyond Good and Evil confirmed Nietzsche's position as the towering European philosopher of his age. The work dramatically rejects traditional Western thought with its notions of truth and God, good and evil. Nietzsche seeks to demonstrate that the Christian world is steeped in a false piety and infected with a slave morality. With wit and energy, he turns from this critique to a philosophy that celebrates the present and demands that the individual impose their own will to power upon the world. This edition includes a commentary on the text by the translator and Michael Tanner's introduction, which explains some of the more abstract passages and beyond good and evil. I mean, all of them were pretty abstract, to be honest, but... So, a few bits that I wanted to share here um, from the author bio. He, he basically went a bit mad. Yeah, it says down here, He became insane in 1889 and remained in a condition of mental and physical paralysis until his death in 1900. And this little passage here I think is very true today in like, in terms of cancel culture and um, I, I guess just the way that we try and find fault in people, especially people from the past, um, because there's usually fault to be found because everyone's human, you know, everyone has faults. But he's, uh, that, actually this is from the introduction, so this is from, uh, let's see, who wrote this? It did say, but it actually doesn't say here. Michael Tanner, so he writes, we indulge in orgies of moral recrimination against those who have done most to enhance our culture, who have given us a very large part of our sense of what makes life worth living. We wish that those who have contributed most to our artistic heritage, our increased knowledge, our political and social arrangements, where those can be prized, had been better men than their biographies more often than not more often than not, show them to have been. The thought that if a great man had been different from what he was, he wouldn't have done what he did, is rapidly dismissed as special pleading. At the same time, we tend to take pleasure in the notion that great men are, in various ways, human or too human. It is part of our fear and anxiety in the face of greatness. One might say we take revenge on the greatness of men's works by studying their lives, prying into them with an intensity of scrutiny from which no one would emerge unscathed. And in the translator's note, R.J. Uh, Hollandale, he talks a little bit about the kind of the situations in which this was published. Um, he became his own publisher. He hoped to cover his cost by selling 300 copies, but by June 1887, only 114 had been sold. So I just think that gives like a lot of hope to authors today who are struggling to sell copies of their books, you know? It does say that in the present century, it's never been out of print. Anyway, on to Beyond Good and Evil proper. I don't actually have a huge number of tabs. Um, it was very dense, and there just wasn't a lot that particularly interested me. So he's talking about religion here, and he says, Religion can even be used as a means of obtaining peace from the noise and effort of cruder modes of government, and cleanliness from the necessary dirt of all politics. Thus did the Brahmins, for example, arrange things. With the aid of a religious organisation, they gave themselves the power of nominating their kings for the people, while keeping and feeling themselves aside and outside as men of higher and more than kingly tasks. I don't know whether I necessarily agree with that form of government, but hey-ho. One of his little maxims and interludes here. One begins to mistrust very clever people when they become embarrassed. And here, one again, <laughs> big general generalisation about the sexes here. But I find it interesting to look at those, you know. So he wrote, The sexes deceive themselves about one another. The reason being that fundamentally they love and honour only themselves, or their own ideal to express it more pleasantly. Thus man wants woman to be peaceful, but woman is essentially unpeaceful, like the cat however well she may have trained herself to present an appearance of peace. And again, on the differences on the sexes, he says, in revenge and in love, woman is more barbarous than man. And then you have the very famous quote here. This is actually the beginning of Baldur's Gate, the uh, computer game which I used to play all the time. So I'm quite familiar with this one. It's, uh, he who fights with monsters should look to it that he himself does not become a monster. And when you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. And this one's quite actually quite deep. He says, our neighbor is not our neighbor, but our neighbor's neighbor. Thus thinks every people. And here he talks about some very like English phenomena. So he says, 
the industrious races find leisure very hard to endure. It was a masterpiece of English instinct to make Sunday so extremely holy and boring that the English unconsciously long again for their week and working days as a kind of cleverly devised and cleverly intercalated fast such as is also to be seen very frequently in the ancient world, although, as one might expect in the case of southern peoples, not precisely in regard to work. There have to be fasts of many kinds, and wherever powerful drives and habits prevail, legislators have to see to it that there are intercalary days on which such a drive is put in chains and learns to hunger again. Seen from a higher viewpoint, entire generations and ages, if they are infected with some moral fanaticism or other, appear to be such intercalated periods of constraint and fasting during which a derive learns to stoop and submit, but also to purify and intensify itself. Certain philosophical sects, for example the Stoa in the midst of the Hellenistic culture, with its air-grown rank and overcharged with aphrodisiac vapours, likewise permit of a similar interpretation. And I believe the Stoa are the, the Stoics which I've been reading quite a lot of Stoic uh, philosophy recently. I found it more approachable than Nietzsche, let's put it that way. And just this little throwaway line here made me chuckle. He goes, the psychologists of France, and where else today are their psychologists, have still not exhausted the bitter and manifold pleasure they take in the bêtise bourgeoisie, just as if enough they thereby betray something. By just like that, where else would they be? And here again, something that hasn't aged particularly well. Um, and again, it's on the sexes. You feel as though um, Nietzsche, if he was around today, would be an incel. So you write, uh, Stupidity in the kitchen, woman as cook, the dreadful thoughtlessness with which the nourishment of the family and the master of the house is provided for. Woman does not understand what food means, and she wants to be the cook. If woman were a thinking creature, she would, having been the cook for thousands of years, surely have had to discover the major facts of physiology, and likewise gain possession of the art of healing. It is through bad female cooks, through the complete absence of reason in the kitchen, that the evolution of man has been longest retarded and most harmed. Even today things are hardly any better. A lecture for high school girls. Yeah, that's one that I don't agree with for obvious reasons. And I just thought this, this is the last thing that I want to share. This is from the what is noble section. So he wrote, a human being who strives for something great regards everybody he meets on his way either as a means or as a delay and hindrance or as a temporary resting place. The lofty goodness towards his fellow men, which is proper to him, becomes possible only when he has reached his height and he rules. Impatience in his consciousness that until that time he is condemned to comedy, for even war is a comedy and a concealment, just as every means conceals the end, spoil all his association with others. This kind of man knows a solitude and what is most poisonous in it. So yeah, Beyond Good and Evil by Friedrich Nietzsche. As I say, I think for me it was mostly interesting for little quotes and aphorisms and stuff like that that I could take away from it, rather than for anything deeper, um, just because it's quite dense and difficult to read. Like, I don't know, it just is. I, I think part of that is because it's philosophy, part of it's because it's old, part of it's because it's translated, but whatever the reason, it just, I mean, I, I, I thought it was okay reading it, but it was nowhere near as like, thought-provoking as Letters from a Stoic by Seneca, which I read around the same time. Uh, I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5, which is my sort of average rating. I'm sure I missed a lot of stuff from it. Um, but yeah, at least I can now say I've read Nietzsche. I thought it was I. Even if he was a bit of an incel. So there we have it. That's what I made of Beyond Good and Evil by Friedrich Nietzsche. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.